And so my first question to him is, <laughs> how did you have a plan? Did you have a target to reach? Not really, although, you know, by the time people started proposing that I create the third book, which sort of compiles a lot of essays I've written in different places, I thought, yes, you know, it strategically makes sense because once you do three books for 30, it never leaves you. For the rest of your life, you're a person who did that. So I was aware of that. But, you know, equally, I thought, you know, enough work had gone into all of these, so it made sense to uh, publish because otherwise my fear was most people publish their essays, etc., when they're retiring. That's, that's the general sense. It's, you know, I didn't want to seem lazy in any way, but because it's all related to history, it's not time-bound, it's not opinion, it's, it's historical, therefore it made sense to compile them. But there was no uh, plan as such. When I began writing, there was no plan. Life looked very different a decade ago when I first got into researching my first book. That was a six-year-long process. It took quite a while, it took away the first half of my 20s doing that one book. Uh, but I think the success of that book sort of energizes your ambitions in terms of your other plans. Otherwise, I'd have been dividing my time between a proper you know, profession, which I had earlier, and writing, whereas that book gave me the confidence to sort of take a leap and, and, and take this calculated risk of becoming a, let's say, full-time writer. But it's, it's working out so far. Yeah, and this, this you know, fascination with history, is it building on, did it build on to you, or did you know, you know straight on that you're going to be working on history for the next many no, years? I actually wrote a lot of awful fiction as a child, which included, you know, really like at the age of 12, I plagiarized a novel I'd read with witches and wizards and decided to create my own story. The exact same plot, just different names and things. The only readers were my father and my sister, and luckily I tore it up, otherwise it would come back to haunt me many years later. Uh, then I did some, you know, poetry also as a kid, which was just funny stuff about my classmates. Again, they tore it up because it was, they deemed it offensive. Uh, but then, no, history always animated me a great deal because it was always alive. Not the textbooks that I read, but the stories I heard. It was history as told to me by elders in my own family, by people around me. And the idea that these were not men and women who occupied a different planet. When you talk about a grandmother or a great-grandfather, these are not people who lived some other, in some other universe. They were human beings like you and me. And that made them come alive in a very interesting way. You know, you go to Kerala, which is where, you know, we'd spend our summers. And my grandmother came from, she's a very imperious woman, also, you know, very good storyteller for that reason. Lots of wit and humor and no censorship of anything. And I grew up listening, you know, in school we'd study, oh, widow remarriage is great reform because women in India, were, you know, were desperate to be saved by, by Western colonial reform and so on, which is partially true, but it only applies to a certain category of people. For a lot of even upper caste groups, forget lower caste groups, Leaving aside the Brahmins, for many groups, widowhood was not necessarily a concept. Remarriage was possible. And then I'd go to Kerala and discover my great-great-grandmother was a divorcee in the 1880s. My great-great-grandfather, who married her, he himself was married first. He had a son by that marriage. Both of them had had children by their first marriages. And it, it, it wasn't at all an unusual thing to do at the time. It was perfectly normal. And they had this rather entertaining marriage, because although they were married for a good 30, 35 years, they never got along. And the stories we heard around this were so entertaining. For example, you know, great-great-grandfather had this canopy bed, this carved canopy bed with a velvet sheet and, you know, silk bolsters and things like that. And uh, he, this was essentially his throne. He was the head of the family and people would come and pay homage to him there while he sort of reclined on this majestic bed. And then her favorite method of annoying him was to round up all the children she could find, douse them in oil, tell them to go play, so their body gets caked with a lot of dirt. And then she invites them to play on his bed. And then, you know, this man gets very offended every time his bed is damaged. He gets his nephews from his own family to come, lift him on the bed, with the bed, and they take him to his family. And then the kids, his own kids go, they fetch him back, they plead, etc. And he comes back in this procession on his bed. The very sight of it, to think that my great-great-grandparents were such eccentric, interesting human beings who had uh, divorces and, you know, multiple marriages and uh, this, this peculiar marriage, all of that was, I thought, you know, it brought them alive in a, in a way that my textbooks did not. And your latest book is called The Courtesan, The Mahatma, and The Italian Brahmin. And for a fleeting moment, I thought you were talking about Rahul Gandhi, you know, when you're talking about Italian Brahmin. But you're not the only one. <laughs> but, but it's not. So who is this guy? Who is this Italian Brahmin? So I, I've said this earlier when I was in Hyderabad for Manthan, which was a few months ago, that the title of the book is rather serpentine. It's a very long title, but it's meant to reflect the three broad research interests of the book. Because otherwise you're meant to have, you know, books with recall value. Yours, for instance, you know, India moving. It's, it's something that comes back to you very quickly. Mine was say, Rebel Sultans for the second one, The Ivory Throne. These are names that you can remember. 
The courtesan, the Mahatma, and the Italian Brahmin is not something you can turn into a hashtag. It's not something that people that you know falls off people's uh, uh, tongues very easily. People, in fact, mix up the the order often. You know, they they think, is it the courtesan, the Mahabharata, and the Italian Brahmin, and things like that? But the idea was that each represents uh, an idea in the book. So the courtesan represents women because we are in the 21st century, in 2020, and we still write these grand narratives of India's past, which are entirely through the eyes of men. You've got a few women here and there, usually the kind of women who went and died on the battlefield on the tip of a sword or something in some very masculine context. Then you sort of deify them. But you forget that there were women of ambition, there were women of cunning, there were women of ability, there were women of creative talent. All of these women have peppered the, 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 the pages of Indian history. We simply haven't been looking at them and giving them their due. So, you know, you've got uh, courtesans specifically because at a time when most women were illiterate, these were literate women. They, were, they had sexual mobility, they had personal autonomy, they had economic uh, mobility to a great extent. I'm talking about the big famous ones. And I think that made them very interesting uh, characters as far as, you know, the gender aspect is concerned. The Mahatma refers to Mahatma Phule, not to Mahatma Gandhi, because, you know, Phule is the man who, in 19th century Pune, Western India, the heart of orthodoxy, uh, in, in, in the West, uh, where they said Brahmins were superior because they were born from the head of the cosmic creator. He's the one who turns around and asks, does that mean the cosmic creator menstruates through the mouth? To think that in the 19th century a man could say that, have the courage to say that. And he's the grandson of a Mali, a gardener, the, the son of a greengrocer. He's not an upper caste elite uh, gentleman. And he, he also challenges our notion of colonialism often. We think of colonialism equal to black and nationalist, the nationalist movement equal to white. But colonialism also uplifted many Indians who finally found that at least the playing field, if not, it wasn't leveled perfectly, but at least it was less unequal. Colonial law is what helped Phule and Savitri Bhai Phule, you know, uh, build their school, prevent attacks on those schools. There's this letter where Savitri Bhai Phule talks about how, and there was a couple in some village outside Pune, a Brahmin boy and a lower caste girl, and they had an affair and the girl got pregnant, and both were about to be lynched. And Savitri Bhai Phule shows up saying, you can't do this, because if you do, I'll make sure that the colonial police come and arrest you, because these are the sections of the law, etc. So they used colonial law to sort of bring themselves up. So colonialism there also gets uh, questioned when you look at it from the perspective of those who are at the bottom of society. And finally, the Italian Brahmin, because the Italian Brahmin represents human quirk and complexity and the fact that Indian history is not merely about our ancestors thinking, you know, chased wonderful things and chanting shlokas all day long. This is people who are rather rich and even comical in some, in some respects. The Italian Brahmin specifically is a man who's, who is not Rahul Gandhi. He is uh, an Italian who came to India in 1604, moved to Madurai two years later, and he moved there as a missionary. And he moved to this mission in Madurai and he discovered that in, a grand, in, a, in, in 15 years, they had a grand success rate of zero, no conversions. So he says, hold on, I'm, not, I'm going to discard these old methods. And he decides to Hinduize his Bible. So he starts preaching the Bible as the fifth Veda. He learns Sanskrit, he learns Telugu, he learns Tamil, he starts traveling. He starts wearing saffron robes like a sannyasi. He acquires a punul or a sacred thread. He creates a caste system between his colleague and him. He says, you're a proper Jesuit in your Jesuit's clothes. You are lower caste from me now. I will only eat food cooked by Brahmins. Uh, when, the, when his superiors in Goa get upset and they say, you know, what are these, these heretical things you're doing? He bypasses them, uses his family connections in Rome to get the Pope to approve his method. And by the end of his life, he's become a proper sannyasi. When he walks into a Hindu court, the king will come out and wash his feet and all of that. And to think that in 17th century India, there was an Italian man going around doing this. It's such a wonderful picture. You know, there's so much richness to that, that story alone. Yeah. So this book has about 60 stories which comes from, so many of them come from your column. He had a column in uh, the Mint newspaper for many years. Uh, since we're in Hyderabad, there's a very nice story on Hyderabad and the courtesan. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah. You know, Hyderabadis have heard this often, I'm assuming. The story of Bhagmati, the, 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 the legendary courtesan who's is supposed to Is it true? Have, see, it's difficult. These is this true questions historians usually will avoid because there is no black and white categorical truth. You have, for instance, she exists in legend, like right from the time there are stories about her. There are people who recorded that this, I mean, the, their wording was rather vulgar. They said this is, uh, the city commemorates a hardened whore and things like that. So very like blunt language there. But there is also a theory that it was Mughal propaganda. Because this king, uh, Muhammad Kuli, who was the Qutub Shah, 
he created this wonderful city. It was quite a magnificent city at the time. And the Mughals had an interest because they were interested in conquering this place. They had an interest in playing it down. You know, they had an interest in saying, no, no, this is, you know, uh, not as great as it seems. This is actually just a thing to flatter a courtesan, to flatter a prostitute. That's the kind of propaganda they put out. Now, the thing is, the legend exists, but you look also at the numismatic uh, record, you look at the other archival sources. The same king had a, had a, had a work that he wrote called the Kuliyat, in which he uh, lists the number of his consorts and his favorite courtesans and people like that. There is no Bhagmati in that. So when you've listed all your favorites, why is your, the favorite for whom you've apparently built a city not uh, present there? The theory that you know, the city was called Bhagnagar, it is called Bhagnagar in a lot of literature. But the coins from the beginning don't use that word. They use either Golconda or they use Hyderabad. There's no Bhagnagar there. So it's very difficult to then uh, categorically say which is true because legend often does reflect it. It has an echo of something that is true. It may not necessarily be the truth, but it could be an echo of something that actually happened. Maybe the king did have uh, a, a, a lover he was extremely fond of, but it would be unusual that he built an entire city to, to flatter. Yeah. And one of the very nice things about this book is it kind of brings about this idea that many of these kings and queens spent time in other kingdoms as well. And so you have this section on the Vijayanagar Empire and its connection with Hyderabad, so to speak. How did you stumble upon that? And what significance does it have in Indian history? You know, this, again, we often assume that back in the day there were kings and kingdoms and they didn't move out and they either hated each other on religious grounds or there was no exchange. But exchange was the nature of human society from day one. You know, there's no doubt about that. So the second essay in the book is on, on Shahu of Tanjaur, a Marathi-speaking king from a Marathi family, Shivaji's nephew, ruling over Tamil territory. His, his generals, etc., Bundelas and Rajputs and Afghans, and his court language is Telugu, because Telugu was the language of prestige in South India till the 18th century, till the late 18th century. So isn't that already a very diverse setting in Tamil Nadu, which we never learn about? Similarly, when you talk about Vijayanagar and the sultanates that existed north of Vijayanagar, people often place it in this clash of civilizations context of Hindu empire versus Muslim kingdom. When they had wars, they certainly used religious vocabulary. You know, that's always the case. People often do that. But in reality, there was lots of mobility that happened between these places. So at one point, the, one of the Adil Shahs uh, fires some 3,000-odd uh, you know, Persian-origin Shias in his court. Where do they move? They all move off to Vijayanagar. Because Vijayanagar is willing to take these talented cavalrymen. When uh, the, 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 the final de facto king of Vijayanagar, Ramaraya, he began his career working as a nobleman under the Qutub Shah of Golconda. The Qutub Shah of Golconda, who was there at the celebrated battle where Vijayanagar is finally defeated, he began, he, he was, his brother was trying to murder him, so he came and lived in exile in Vijayanagar, not in any Islamic kingdom nearby. He came, he chose to come and live in Vijayanagar. The Nizam Shahis of, of Ahmednagar, they were descended from a Brahmin who converted to Islam. And these men then ended up taking not only Persian wives, but also African wives and Maratha wives. Now, where do you place them in that category? They are Shia Muslims officially, but there's plenty of Maratha blood coming into this. The Adil Shahi dynasty from day one, you know, you, uh, the, the first Adil Shah who comes off from, from Persia or Iraq or wherever, marries a Maratha woman. And she's not a... She's not merely a womb to produce children. She is a woman of force and personality. Because two generations later, when there's a grandson who's not up to the mark, it is the same Maratha grandmother who blinds that boy, puts him to the side, and gets an illegitimate grandson installed on the throne. She was a woman with capacity and access to power. So we, I mean, we must understand that we now do things at a much faster pace, but movement was always the reality of Indian society. You know this better than anything else. Migration always happened. Perhaps not at mass level to this extent, but at elite levels, traders, you know, the same traders who supplied goods to Vijayanagar ended up supplying it to the Sultanates also. The same poets, you know, Shetraya composes poems in, in Madurai and all these Hindu courts, these, these padams, and he'll compose 1,500 of them for the uh, Qutub Shah of Golconda because the Qutub Shah is a great patron of Telugu and a great, uh, you know, patron of the Mahabharata and, and poetry derived from the Mahabharata and so on. Lots of movement at, at, at the cultural level. There. Yeah. Since we have a former Reserve Bank governor in the audience, question uh, out here is on, you know, uh, movement of riches, you know, we, say, we usually look at it in terms of plunder, but how, how do you see this? I mean, are there instances of, you know, are these fables or are they actual recorded events of people, you know, plundering cities and actually physically taking all the riches out? You know, Shivaji's sack of Surat is very real because we know there's lots of evidence there. The British, the English were there, they were not sacked, but they kept a record of what was happening. Uh, even the Maratha sources tell you about the kind of wealth that was derived from there. 
And, and, and for the Maratha state as it evolved, this became a regular pattern. You go and you sort of uh, seize or you demand a portion of the revenue of territories that you don't directly govern. So there is wealth extraction of that sort. What happens is in the medieval era, we, you find that the states that emerge are military states. Military states are built on strong armies and, and, and a hierarchy that's built on cavalry forces, gunpowders come in, artillery is increasing. You need, you need bullion, you need gold, etc. for it. And this is precisely why India also attracts people from Africa and Persia and all these places. There is extraction, but we should also know that there's a lot of exaggeration. So, for instance, when uh, you, you look in an Islamic source or a, or a Persian source or an Arabic source, they say, yes, this particular Mahmud of Ghor or Ghazni or one of these places came, one of these uh, rulers came, invaded this place and went back with these mountains of gold and piles of you know, silver and heaps of diamonds and all of that. They did take back a lot of treasure, but they had an interest in playing up how much treasure. Because it, by writing in Persian and Arabic, they're not informing Indians of how much treasure was taken. They're trying to impress their other friends in the Islamic world of how successful the conquest has been. So there's always an element of exaggeration. Kings exaggerate. That is the job of kings, to make yourself look larger than life. You build it on exaggeration and lies. Even today, men in power do that. You build up all kinds of fables around you. You build up public relations around you. And you become a great hero and a great leader. Because, you know, that's the kind of... Uh, that's how politics was and that's how politics still is. So there is truth to the extraction of, of, of treasure and gold, etc. But the question is, where does it move? To what purpose is it used? And how much exaggeration is there in that? Uh, one of the fascinating characters who I personally did not know much about, and apologies, is Basava, you know, in, in uh, South India again. Uh, and there's a lot of politics around that today. And you very nicely bring that about in the book. Can you just tell us a little bit you know, about Basava is again one of those very original minds of the 12th century, no less. You know, a man who says, loaded with the Vedas, the Brahmin is a veritable donkey. You know, imagine saying that today. Uh, he's the one who says, when you see a stone snake, you'll say, pour the milk, pour the milk, do your puja. And then you see a real snake and you say, run away, beat the snake, kill the snake. So he was basically calling out hypocrisy, not of the Brahmin community as such, but of Brahminism or casteism as it were. And to think that Basava's movement eventually collapsed. He was a very important bureaucrat in, in the court at Kalyanam. He was a Brahmin himself, someone who, who gave up uh, Brahminical customs and rituals. And what is interesting is that his movement finally collapsed when he did something very striking. He began with interdining. So you start ensuring that everybody eats together. And the complexity of the caste system in this is fascinating. You know, there's in, in Kerala, for example, uh, technically the Nayas are not supposed to eat with Brahmins. But there are some Naya families which have the right. But that is called uh, Sakshi Bhojanam, which is you can eat in the same room but not in the same line. You go up one level, you go to the Zamoran of Calicut, who's stuck between Brahmin and, uh, and the Naya. He has the right to uh, sit in the same line and eat, but nobody else in his family. Someone like the Cochin Raja can actually touch and eat, because that's how the caste system is intricate. It's graded to that fine extent of whether you're sitting in the same room and eating, or whether you're sitting next to a Brahmin and eating. So Basava says, I'm going to break this. I'm going to start uh, interdining. There are, there are lots of people frowning. They don't like it, etc., etc. But he, because of his power and his hold at court, he somehow survives. He's, he's, a lot of fake cases are made against him. You see that against politicians today. It wasn't like these things didn't happen in the past. He was accused of embezzlement and lots of other charges, and he survived. Finally, however, one day he gets an intermarriage done. The daughter of a Brahmin with the son of a Dalit caste member. Perhaps even if it was the other way around, a Dalit woman marrying a Brahmin, people would have taken it. But a Brahmin woman marrying a Dalit man was, far, it, it was I think, the final straw that broke the camel's back. And they decided to go down violently on this movement. And within a year, Basava also dies. And the movement really has to go underground for many years. And it's only later that it forms uh, in, into, into the community that we know today. Essentially by accepting a compromise with the Brahmins, saying that, fine, we'll stick to our customs almost like a separate sect or a separate caste. And we won't uh, be so direct and so pointed in our, in our criticism. So to think that, you know, in the 12th century, people were lynched after Basava got this. The parents of the, of the couple, this intercaste couple, they were beaten up and murdered. And to think that this still happens in 2020, a thousand years have passed, and we're still fighting those same battles again and again and again. Yeah. When I can rem just last week, I think, even, there's a whole politics about whether Jeff Bezos is invited for a particular dinner or not. So I think these, these are themes which are which, uh, sort of, uh, you know, continuously running. When I read your book, The Geographic Focus, uh, I think a lot of your research also is, you know, based in South, Central, roughly North India. Uh, what do we know about Eastern India, especially Northeast, you know? 
is it that we don't know enough or there are equally fascinating tales that remain to be told? There are fascinating tales. The Ahom dynasty was a very long ruling house, so there's lots of like uh, information about them. More interestingly, even for modern Indian history, you know, the history of the Northeast often challenges our own pious claims about being this wonderful constitutional society. Because from day one, we've never really been a democracy, a full democracy in the Northeast. The Nagas, for instance, when in the 19th century, the British marched into their hills and their territories saying, hello, you know, we're now taking over and these hills belong to us. And the Nagas said, who the hell are you? And these don't belong to you. And they resisted the British till 1947. 1947, independence comes and they said, just because the British have left and uh, a Sarkari Babu from somewhere else in India has come, we're not going to stop fighting. We're going to keep asserting our identity. So that battle in that sense continued. And from the beginning, there was a uh, military force that was used in the Northeast. From the beginning, even someone like Nehru condoned the use of very aggressive ac action over there by the armed forces. Uh, from the beginning, there was no uh, full democracy there. So the Northeast to me is interesting because it challenges... We, we talk of Kashmir often, but we don't talk enough about how the Northeast is this mirror that constantly questions us about our own claims of constitutionality and our own claims of being a liberal democracy, democracy and all that. Because, you know, from day one, as I said, the army its, has, its, has its strong powers in, in the Northeast as, is it, as it has in Kashmir. Yeah. Uh, you have a, a large part of your book which is on India under the Raj, uh, roughly the 19th century. And two interesting characters are Macaulay and Curzon. You know, how do you see these two characters? Do you have a preference for one of them? A preference. You know, this is, having to choose between Macaulay and Curzon is a tough ask. But uh, I suppose, you know, the thing is, again, to look, the reason I've inclu included essays on them is to suggest that these are not villains of imperial society as we generally think. What is Curzon famous for? The partition of Bengal. And, you know, for that, he, he got his due. He was finally booted out. His chances at becoming prime minister in Britain were completely smashed. His wife left him, and he died a really bitter old man. But... I mean, Curzon also, on the other hand, has a very interesting career in India prior to the partition of Bengal. For instance, at one point in Burma, which was still then part of the Indian Empire as it was called, there were a bunch of troops, king's troops, who went and raped a local woman. The entire British establishment, the entire British army wanted to bury it. Curzon was the one man who said, I will not bury it. He genuinely believed that the British were in India to civilize these barbaric Indians. But he actually believed it, with the result that he said, if you're here to civilize, you can't behave like this. You can't violate a woman and expect to get away scot-free after committing a crime. So he said they have to be punished. His own commander-in-chief didn't support him. The British government didn't support him. And finally, all he could do was get the entire regiment transferred to, uh, the entire unit transferred to some complete like punishment posting kind of situation. But he tried very hard for that. Uh, he was a great protector of the monuments. The ASI had practically died by then. They, they had started it a few decades earlier. Nobody was interested in protecting Indian monuments. It was Curzon. There are stories of how he walked into a, one of these... You see it around Golconda. You know, there are these, there's the main tomb complex, but then the, on the way there are these small tombs. And you see now that people have built little houses attached to that, and someone's using one as their drawing room and things like that. He once walked into one of these tombs somewhere in North India and discovered that they were, they were running a post office inside it. And there and then he got them to sort of scoot. And he got them to lift their desks and their posts and all of that and get out of there saying, you can't sit here and turn a monument into a post office. He's the one, there's a, there's a silver lamp that hangs over Mumtaz Mahal's uh, tomb in the Taj Mahal. He's the one who actually spent personal money to get that commissioned in Egypt to come and hang it in the Taj Mahal. He did a lot for protecting Indian monuments, something that even someone like Nehru acknowledged. Because Nehru said, Curzon may have been the villain of partition as far as Bengal is concerned. But in many other ways, in, in protecting our monuments, he played a very constructive role. So the same villain of, of empire here becomes a different person. Macaulay, you know, Macaulay was, yeah, he wanted to create a class of Indians who were brown in color, but English in mind and in intellect and tastes, etc. But why is it that Dalits often uh, celebrate Macaulay's birthday as Macaulay Jayanti? Because for them, the English language was a language of power. They never had access to Sanskrit. They never had access to uh, large literary corpuses within India. But English gave them a passport to upward mobility, and they used that in, in, in constructive and positive ways. So many Dalit communities around the country celebrate Macaulay's birthday, because for them, he's not a villain. Uh, there also you find a certain complexity. So, you know, there's, uh, the idea is merely to suggest that history is not these simplistic stories that we get in our, in our textbooks or in our received wisdom. You scratch or you peel back one layer and you start discovering, hold on, there are more questions that emerge rather than one constructive or one you know, categorical truth. So one of, the, one of the things you also do in the book is present counterfactual history. 
That is, uh, what if the Vijayanagar Empire did not collapse? What if the Mahatma had not died, and so on? Uh, so just you know, building on to that. So for example, we are speaking English today. If the British had not come, what language would we be speaking in? Likely, we would have been speaking in Persian, most probably, because Persian was the language of diplomacy in India and much of the uh, this part of Asia back in the day. And this uh, this was something I first got interested in when I was doing my research in my Travancore book, and I came across a letter written around 1818 by the Maharani of Travancore. Her name was Gauri Parvati Bai. She was a Malayali queen, writing to the English governor in Madras at that time. He's an Englishman. She's a Malayali. What do they? What language do they use to communicate? Persian. Even in Kerala, the courts of Kerala were using Persian when they were communicating with other courts in India. There, there are phases. So right now, English is the language of the world. English is the language of globalization. English is the link language that brings the world together. The previous 800 odd years, it was Persian. Persian connected not only parts of Thailand on one end, but also all the way to Egypt and places like that, because that's what everybody used. Even the British used Persian, as I said, in India till in the, till the 1830s. Before that, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, there was what scholars call a Sanskrit cosmopolis. How did the Ramayana, Mahabharatam, and all these epics go off to far-flung places overseas? Because the Sanskrit language was a language of prestige that had, it could be communicated and it could be exported to other places where it was willingly accepted. There are phases in history where different languages become dominant at that level, which does not mean that other languages are unimportant. It's, so uh, the reason with the counterfactuals is counterfactuals is a very naughty thing to do when you're working with history. But the idea was simply, again, there to hold up a mirror, saying, if you think that the British hadn't come and we would have been one unitary paradise of, of, of Hindu rule, that's not true. We would have been a very different place, speaking Persian, you and me having this conversation, either in Persian or in French. I was hoping you'd say Marathi, you know, given your Pune yeah. background and my Mumbai background. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to open out for questions. So if uh, any of you have questions, just raise your hand. Yeah. Start with you. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Hey. So, um, in regards to language, uh, I noticed that Ivory Throne has been translated into Malayalam. How important is it for histo uh, history and other subjects to be translated into state languages? Do you think that there's some importance, or do you think that publishers tend to gloss over this because they don't think they'll get enough return on investing in state languages? On the contrary, we're going through a time when translation is seeing a boom. In fact, we've got Benjamin sitting here. Increasingly, you're discovering that, you know, people thought there were these great literary novels in the English language and, you know, path-breaking, etc. And you're like, these have been covered by writers in Indian languages. Often, the same ideas, the same impulses have been covered with far greater force and originality in Indian writing. Now, increasingly, you're finding fascinating combinations as far as translators are concerned. K.R. Meera and J. Devika. J. Devika is an intellectual of great, uh, of a very high caliber, a personality in her own right. So she understands what Meera is trying to communicate. Benjamin's, uh, you know, uh, translator also. These are people who've formed a team now and they do an extraordinary job of translation. So far from English history being translated into Malayalam, the, what is enriching the conversation is the other way around, where, you know, access to material that's being produced in the States is actually making uh, the national, as it were, uh, come alive in more in more interesting ways, because uh, you know that's that's. I, I'm just surprised it's taken us so long to get there, because this should have been done ages ago. All right. Yeah. The lady behind. Yeah. Yeah. Please keep your questions as short as possible. Very very short. So when you write, what does your research process look like? Oh, well. So usually I work in cycles. So my last research cycle was a year and a half, where it was 10 hours, 12 hours a day in the library, in the archives, day after day after day after day, plodding through, simply culling material, simply creating my files and my documents on my laptop and computer, and putting it away. I'm not digesting it. I'm not trying to understand it. It's simply getting the information in order. Once the information is in order, now I came back from my last research cycle at the end of 2018. It's been over a year but I haven't had the time so far to sit and write. But that first begins with going through my own notes. This includes notes taken from about 500, 600 books, for example, academic journals, original archival material, trying to sort of put your head to understand and place all of these pieces of the puzzle together uh, is the next challenge. And then finally comes the writing, which in some ways is the easiest of the, of the, of the three bits, because research is the toughest part. Uh, it's not easy in the sense that trying to condense research from multiple places into one 300, 400 page book. I don't intend to write a 700 page book ever again. Um, that takes its own time. And then comes the final stage of 
polishing the writing, making sure the quality of the writing is nice, that every page appeals to the reader and the reader has an incentive, therefore, to turn the page. Because you have to also think from the perspective of the reader. You're not, I'm not writing to impress myself. I'm trying to get other people to read it, which means you have to be conscious of how it reads to a third person. So a certain distance comes. Uh, and the research, of course, includes, uh, as I, you know, I've been saying recently, there was a time when we thought research was merely about what is in the archives and the documents. So you see something in writing and you think, oh, this is what is relevant. But in a, in a society like ours, which was unequal and casteist, where literacy was often the preserve of upper caste groups, a lot of history is not written down. It's not codified. In, in Travancore, when I did my Travancore book, there is the official narrative of a king called Martanda Varma, which is presented in all the official histories of the state, because there's a proper archival record of it. But from, the, from Martan Varma's own time, there was also a counter-narrative, a counter-narrative that was put down by people who sang what are called Villapata. Villapata are these folk songs, really, that were done for a few rituals and ceremonies and festivals in, in southern Travancore, in which Martan Varma, this glorified king, is the villain. And it's existed all the way from his lifetime. So there was, even in his time and throughout the time that the official narrative dominated, there was always a counter-narrative. A historian has to look at all of this. You have to look at art, you have to look at literature, you have to look at architecture, you have to look at all of these things. Art, for instance, you know, I recently, a few months ago, went to Sri Rangapatna. Now, you have your usual records of Tipu Sultan and so on, but in Sri Rangapatna, there's one of India's biggest murals in what uh, was Tipu Summer Palace. And it, it, it commemorates or depicts the Battle of Pullalur. And it's a fascinating mural painting, you know, missing heads, arms chopped off, dead bodies everywhere, gore and blood. But in the middle of this, you have Tipu Sultan sitting on this gigantic, you know, abnormally large horse, smelling a rose, very serenely as though he's in a garden. And what is he trying to communicate through that? He's trying to show that victories are short. I won this battle, which is true. It is a word of propaganda art. He's trying to show that he is completely won and he's, he's perfectly confident about defeating the British. How are the British de depicted? The British colonel is shown sitting in a palanquin, which is supposed to suggest effeminacy, chewing his nails. The idea is, this is propaganda art. That one painting tells you so much more than you will find in any official record of the painting being created. Uh, for instance, the, you know, which, why rulers uh, patronize certain kinds of art at certain moments, that gives you a sense of you know, what they were thinking at different moments. Why is it that oil painting came up in the 19th century in such a big way at the cost of a lot of other kinds of painting? These are the questions that also historians have to engage with, not merely what is written down in files and documents. Now, I, I said this at my last Manthan event, but I'll repeat it again. One of my favorite uh, essays in the book is on this, Maratha Shahu, who I referred to, the Maratha king in the Telugu-speaking court in Tamil Nadu. Now, he, you have the official inscriptional record, donations he made to the temple in, in, in Tanjaur. You've got all the other official details on him. But he was also a playwright. He wrote a Telugu play of startling originality, a parody of the caste system, where there is a protagonist called Morobatlu the Magnificent. He's a Brahmin. And Morobatlu is on the way to a temple festival. This is written in uh, 1705, 18th century, by Shivaji's nephew. Now, Morobatlu is on the way with his chela, his disciple. And on the way, in the distance, he sees a very beautiful woman. So he says, oh, I must go flirt with that woman. Now the disciple says, no, no, you're a great Shastri, you're a Pandit. Think of the subtle meaning of Vedic words. Think of philosophy. And Morobatlu says, no, no, I don't want insipid eternal bliss. I want the bliss that comes with spending an evening with this lady. Now the disciple says, can't stop this man from be behaving like a creep. So they go to the lady. Lady turns around, turns out she's an untouchable. She's a Dalit woman. First she says, oh, I'm a Dalit, so you, you as a Brahmin can't have dealings with me. He says, no, no, we Brahmins have created all these rules for ourselves, so you chill. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll have this, uh, this arrangement. Then she says, oh, no, you know, I'm married, so I can't have any dealings with you. He says, well, give me your loins like you would donate land to a Brahmin. This lady is getting more and more anxious. So finally she says, oh, you know, we drink uh, liquor and we eat beef, so we're not pure for you. And he, this Brahmin replies saying, uh, well, you know, we drink cow's milk and we worship the cow. You eat the whole cow, you must be purer than me. <laughs> this was written in the 18th century by Shivaji's nephew. Shivaji is presented by later historians as protector of cows and Brahmins. Here is his nephew in his time writing a parody of the caste system, a play that was performed year after year after year in a temple festival and consumed by large audiences like this, which meant there was cultural confidence. The mark of any culture, culture's confidence is the ability to laugh at yourself, to parody your own conventions and social systems. And they had it then. Today, a writer can't write this. So, you know, you have to, so that, that literature, that piece of literature gives you an insight into the king's mind that, a, that an inscription telling that the king donated 5,000 pieces of gold to a temple will not.
So a historian has to look at all these sources to get something that resembles the truth. It only resembles it. It never is the complete truth. One last question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in one of your podcasts, you have stated that uh, the Kakatiyas were one of the few kingdoms who embraced their Shudra identity. Uh, why is it specific to Kakatiyas and why did, not, why did the other kingdoms not do that? It's usually, I think, a question of chronology and time because it's also often a question of geography. You know, places that... Now look at where in Tamil Nadu, for example, where are the Brahmin communities dominated? It's in the fertile areas where there were the big cities and so on. You go further south to the drier areas and you find that the Brahmin domination is slightly lower. And culture, therefore, is also slightly different. People aren't as ritualistic. People aren't as caught up in, in, in some sort of rigid caste identity. These things change on the basis of geography and how people move and migrate and settlements arise. So in, in Kakatiya territory, I suppose that that process of Brahmanization was perhaps slower. And this is, I'm, I'm quoting entirely from Richard Eaton's work, really, where he's the one who went through all these inscriptions and, and, and came to this conclusion. Uh, and even in Kerala, you know, Shudra kings were the norm till the 18th century. When Maharaja Marthandorma of Travancore wants to upgrade himself from a, a Shudra to a Kshatriya, first he has to find Brahmins willing to do it. Then he has to import lots of Tamil Brahmins because all the big Namudris of Kerala live in uh, northern Kerala, not in, in, not in the southern part where he lived. And he has to... Uh, now, you go to, you're a powerful man, you've got power, but power as a commodity is not enough. What are you trying to seek through these rituals? You're trying to get legitimacy. And legitimacy is something supplied by Brahmins at demand. So, for instance, there's always a formula to, to bypass things. So, the, Martha Dorma's chosen formula was Hiranyagarbha, where they construct a golden cow. And the cow is based on a cow that has all the right lakshanas. The tail has to be this way, there has to be a spot in the right place, things like that. Once the cow is constructed, the king goes through the mouth of the cow, sits inside the cow for a certain duration. And the Brahmins will pelt it with Gomutra and Pala Bishaykama, whatever it is, and, and flowers, and they'll chant the birth mantras. So when Martanda Varma, or the Shudra king who went in through the mouth of the cow, emerges from under the tail of the cow, suddenly he's Soma Vamsha, Surya Vamsha, whatever Vamsha he wants to be. Suddenly he can wear the sacred thread, and suddenly he's elevated himself into caste, into the Kshatriya caste. He's twice born. In Madurai, when one of the Madurai Tanjaur, one of the Nayaka kings did the same ceremony, he additionally had to fall into the, the arms of the Brahmin priest's wife and wail like a baby to confirm that this was his, his uh, second birth. Shivaji. Shivaji was a Maratha. Marathas were seen very much as sons of the soil. Uh, when Shivaji wanted to be crowned, when he was a warlord, when he became a, 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 an important ruler, uh, the head of a territory that was almost autonomous, people said, fine, you've got territory, you've got power, you've got your army, but you are still not a king. So when you go in front of the Qutub Shah of Golconda, who's a sultan, you have to bow because you're not the king's equal. So Shivaji says, no, I must get this uh, identity. I must get legitimacy as a king. Having army and having an army and having territory is not enough to be a king. He goes through a process, not a Hiranyagarbha, but a similar process, where Maharashtrian Brahmins say, no, we, we refuse to do it for you. He imports a gentleman from Banaras. Uh, a family tree is discovered connecting Shivaji to the Sisodias of Rajputana. So suddenly the bloodline has become clear. And it's assumed that his ancestors had forgotten that they were... Uh, they were Kshatriyas and lapsed into ways like this. Mysore royal family in the 1690s, same principle, where, they, where the Arasas forgot that they were Kshatriyas and they'd lapsed into Shaivite worship. So there's a ritual done to purify them back into Vaishnavite worship and they get an upgraded caste status. All of this is about legitimacy. The Kakatiyas perhaps didn't care because they lived in an ecosystem where it didn't matter yet. Whereas as, as you come later in time, where that Sanskritic influence becomes stronger and stronger, and that starts supplying legitimacy to wannabe kings. Kings who have come up from the ground, but need to concoct a genealogy to look like real kings. That's when uh, you have this ultra sanskritic ritual available. So I think we have run out of time, so we'll uh, end with the most important buzzword of our times, which is uh, Aap Chronology Samajye. <laughs> first, Manu <laughs> first Manu will speak, then we will ask questions, then we will buy his books. So they're all kept out here. Uh, his... Uh, main idea in, the, in all his writings is that history should not be seen in black or white, but the one exception is his own books, which come in two gorgeous covers, black and white. <laughs> right? So you can actually indulge in those books out here. So thanks a lot, Manu, and thank you all for coming. But I, I thought the buzzword of our times was Azadi, not Aap Chronology Samajay.